Hello, everyone. Hope you all had a good spring break, and we have some guests here today visiting, um, so welcome to you, too. Um, today, we're going to be um, hearing from one of our own, Katrin Patterson, who's actually in um, the Department of Maternal and Child Health working on her master's degree. She'll finish in May. So she's going to be presenting on contraceptive options for men. You've heard um, a number of lectures related to uh, contraception, and primarily we've been focusing on women's health, so this will be a little bit different. Um, and she has three years of experience uh, prior to coming back to school in program development, implementation, and evaluation. Um, in particular, she's worked um, at the University of Botswana Center for the Study of HIV and AIDS, where she was an associate researcher working on um, gender and psychosocial dynamics of HIV transmission for the research team at the center. Uh, there she conducted informal interviews with students on perceptions of HIV education and their attitudes towards HIV testing, male circumcision, and sexual abstinence. Um, and she's interested in continuing her work in um, contraceptive education and health communication after she graduates. So we're really excited to have Kat um, here this evening. Kat. Hello. So glad to be here. Welcome back from spring break. And if I can get the hang of this mobile mic so I don't feel chained to the podium. Let's see how that goes. Hello, hello. Hello? Hello. Yes. Excellent. All right. So thank you for that excellent introduction. Um, I am here to talk with you tonight about a topic that has gripped me for the last semester. This is my master's project deliverable, actually, so I'm really delighted to be here tonight, and I'm delighted that Dorothy is letting me talk to you. So before we get started, though, I wanted to make it clear that advocating for male contraceptive research and development is not advocating against female contraceptive research and development. I believe that male contraception is a complement to um, female contraception, not instead of. So just to make it perfectly clear that what we're talking about here is a complementary technology or set of technologies uh, looking really to increase reproductive health and reproductive choice. So really quickly, since we are still in school, we have to have objectives. Um, by the time you leave here tonight, I hope that you have an um, understanding of the current contraceptive options for men and why they're insufficient the social, historical, and biological hurdles to developing new methods, the rationale for increasing choice by developing improved methods, and the challenges of providing modern male methods in settings um, different than our own. So, the question of the evening, why male contraception? Does anyone want to start? All right, no worries. So the very first thing is what we have is only part of the picture. So, for fun, Planned Parenthood says that there's five methods of male-controlled contraception that are currently available. Can I have a few people who thinks number, what one, number one is? Yes. Abstinence. Yeah. <laughs> well said. All right. Second one. Shout it out. Condoms. Yes. Male condoms. Love it. Third one. Withdrawal. Yes. All right, two more. Fourth? Vasectomy. Yeah. And the last one. This one actually surprised me a little bit, so I'll just give it to you. Outer course. Does anyone know what outer course is? All right, so just to clarify, outer course is uh, sexual activity that does not include uh, penis and vagina sex. So essentially, having sex without getting semen inside the vagina. Um, we're going to do a quick activity. I want everyone to break into groups of three or four, turn into your neighbors, and I want you to give these five methods a score between one and seven. These are the ideal contraceptive traits um, in a standard gynecology textbook that I found. 
Um, so the ideal contraceptive would be highly effective, have no side effects or risks, be cheap, independent of intercourse, and require no regular action on the part of the user, have non-contraceptive benefits, be acceptable to all cultures and religions, and be easily distributed and administered by non-healthcare personnel. So in groups of three or four, each of these traits being one point, rate one or two of these methods um, with a score between one and seven, depending on how many of the traits you think apply to the, to the methods that you choose. Make sense? I think we will take four or five minutes to do that. Is this on? <laughs> All right, has everyone scored at least one method? All right. So who did abstinence? Anyone do abstinence? We did all of them. Oh, well, they did all Right, so what's their score for abstinence? Four. Four. All right. Anyone else do abstinence? Five. Five? All right. All right, and one more score. Four. Four. Okay, four, five, four. Condoms. Male condoms.
doing numbers for outer course? Two. Two? Okay. Any last numbers? Going once, going twice? Zero. Zero? <laughs> okay, zero works too. Right, so, <laughs> great point. So obviously, looking around here, not many of these got close to seven, which would have been all of these, right? So we've got seven traits here. The closest one we have is abstinence, amazingly enough. Um, but I remember being very surprised that Planned Parenthood would include that, include that as a, oh, pardon, would include that as a contraception method, um, because similar to our course, it seems to kind of avoid the reason why contraceptives are developed in the first place. Uh, so abstinence, right, by textbook, is a very effective uh, contraceptive. Um, condoms and vasectomy have almost zero uptake in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. Uh, so that really makes us wonder what's going on there. Outer course scored very low, and um, withdrawal is hard. We actually don't have very much formal research on withdrawal. For example, we don't know if there's a difference between uh, success rates in older men versus younger men, um, even though there might actually be a level of experience that goes into it, because you could actually argue that withdrawal is a skill. So, <laughs> back to our first point. What we have is only part of the picture. There's still a very high rate of unintended pregnancy, and the matter of the fact is, is that if these are the only methods that men have, and they're very a far cry from what an ideal contraceptive would be, we're actually not serving them very well. Another consideration for, from a personal and a financial standpoint is that child support is expensive. Um, in 2010, the average monthly child support payment was $430, um, and I know that for myself, I'd rather do other things with that um, money than have to worry about supporting potentially an un, um, unintentional pregnancy or the result of that. So, frankly put, some men who have sex aren't ready to be a father yet or ever. Uh, making sure that they have the opportunity to shape their reproductive lives the way they want to is really important. Another issue is that female partners can't or won't use certain birth control methods. So in 2012, the Society for Women's Health Research published a survey that showed that two out of five women in the United States don't use any form of birth control. So if you're a man sleeping with that woman, or you know, what is that man to do? What is that couple to do uh, if they don't want to conceive? Uh, there's any number of reasons why female partners or even male partners themselves wouldn't use a method such as allergies, um, intolerances, or even potentially uh, religious or cultural reasons, right? So that's another thing to consider if your partner won't use a, a contraceptive method. Um, potentially eco-friendly might make more sense as we talk about other methods, uh, but consider that about 5 billion condoms are sold worldwide each year. That's a lot of uh, rubber, latex, potentially lambskin that ends up in oceans and landfills. So if you were eco-conscious, maybe finding an, a method with a smaller environmental footprint could be worth it. Um, another reason to look into male contraceptive development and male fertility so that we can better understand male infertility. So infertility affects about one in 20 men in this country. And being able to help them is no, you know, there's nothing to, Dismiss. So researching male contraception and getting a better handle on male fertility will, in turn, give us a better understanding of male infertility. <coughs> and then lastly, sexual agency is a human right. Uh, so I know that Dr. Peterson spoke in this course earlier this semester, and so I know you've seen the World Health Organization's definition for sexual health, and I think it's definitely worth um, invoking here again. So if you remember, the definition for sexual health is not just the absence of disease, but the mental, emotional, physical, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. And when you think about it that way, the absence of modern male contraceptives is, um, is an oversight of, males, of men's ability to direct their reproductive lives. Um, and so this is just a, a small list of why looking into male contraceptives is a, uh, is a worthwhile endeavor. So a brief history, you, you can't really know where you're going until you know where you've come from. Um, so as long as human beings have, having, have been having sex, we figured out pretty quickly that it takes a penis inside a vagina, usually to create a baby or to have a pregnancy. Um, and just about as long, we've been finding ways to 
wrap the penis or stop um, fertilization happening. So earlier condoms were created using cloth, using leather, um, using oiled paper and uh, animal horn, believe it or not. And it doesn't sound particularly comfortable on my end, but if it works, it works. Um, in the mid 1800s though, Charles Goodyear, the same man credited with creating the Goodyear tire, um, helped the condom along greatly by discovering the vulcanization process, which allows rubber to stick and stick together essentially and be bouncy. Um, so we've been enjoying variations of that <laughs> discovery ever since. Um, this condom here is called the Paragon Sheath. It was sold in London in 1948. And uh, the directions on the box are really interesting. They say that this model is improved because it doesn't go hard in cold weather and it doesn't have a seam, so it's less likely to um, rip. Uh, but the, the rest of the writing is uh, instructions for its care and keeping because it's reusable. So uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, also around this time, vasectomies were used for birth control for the, the first time starting in World War II. Um, and then shortly thereafter in the 60s is when hormonal birth control showed up in the form of the birth control pill for women. And um, since then, a lot of the research has focused explicitly on female reproductive systems and how to work with them, largely focusing on hormonal methods, although there are several non-hormonal methods that are being looked at as well and used. Uh, so this is one of my favorite pictures because it shows one of the first high-profile public health campaigns um, aimed at involving men in family planning. So this guy is known as the pregnant man. He was released by the UK's Family Planning Association in 1970. And um, he you know, very, says very clearly, would you be more careful if you knew that it was you that got pregnant? Um, and this is really fascinating because 40, 50 some years later, we're still having the conversation of how to involve men in family planning. And the argument here, is, and especially with the, the absence of modern male contraceptives, is that it doesn't always help to educate someone about an issue if you don't give them the tools to do something about it. So what are those tools? So the first uh, method I'd like to introduce is the use of ultrasound as a contraceptive. So starting in the 1970s, Dr. Mustafa Fahim at the University of Missouri established that ultrasound suppresses the production of sperm cells. Um, he published several papers, uh, but unfortunately his funding ran out after about 10 years. And it was only in the early 2000s when a team here at UNC actually picked up the trail and figured out how to um, kind of sort of replicate his results. Uh, the difficulty is, is that Dr. Fahim was using unique equipment specifically built for his study and the team, was unable, the team here at UNC wasn't able to get their hands on the machine or the specs. Uh, but what the team did figure out was this little, uh, I guess, formulation here was 15 minutes of three megahertz at 2.2 watts per square centimeter twice <laughs> resulted in the suppression of um, sperm cells or the, the specific name is spermatogenesis, so stopping the production of sperm cells. So we figured out that it's very effective in animals with smaller testicles, um, but there's, there's some issues about sem or sperm quality after the effect subsides. So Dr. Fahim claimed that his protocol, which was somewhat different from what the UNC team did here, uh, resulted in sterility for up to six months. So you could come in for a 15 minute procedure um, and then that you would be good to go for six months, which is pretty impressive. Um, but this is a method, as more people are looking at it, they're wondering if it might be better for, steril for non-surgical sterilization. Um, and people have been, researchers have already been looking at its use in, um, in animals, so for example, dogs and cats, and just making sure that we could be using that instead of a more costly spaying and neutering uh, technique. Uh, but one of the things that was really fascinating about the UNC team's project was that they were adamant about this method being available um, around the world, no matter what resource you are in. And that's where this is really, this is where it gets kind of cool. Meet the Ch Chattanooga Intellect Transport Ultrasound Machine. Uh, I checked e eBay the other day and found a model that was selling for $945. Um, and it can, it's quite, um, as the name suggests, 
uh, portable. You can probably slide it into your messenger bag. And um, the, the beauty of this method would be that you could equip someone, most likely not a healthcare personnel who, who just needed a little bit of training on how to use the machine, who would then be able to, in theory, uh, visit one community maybe twice a year um, to have a full year of contraceptive effect. Uh, but the, this method is, like I mentioned, starting to look more like a sterilization technique as opposed to a true contraceptive, since what we're looking for, if we keep looking at our ideal contraceptive checklist, is that, ooh. Well, I guess it falls under highly, um, highly effective, but really the idea of a contraceptive is that we want it to be reversible. <laughs> so that's method number one. Method number two is uh, called the clean sheets pill. Uh, so starting in the 1950s, doctors noticed that patients taking a hypertension medication called phenoxybenzamine uh, became infertile. And uh, since then, there's been a small bread crumb trail of research that's been isolating the contraceptive effects of pheno pheno phenoxybenzamine, excuse me, and other related medications. And the way the clean cheese pill works is truly fascinating. What it does is it relaxes the longitudinal muscles in the male contraceptive tract while still allowing the circular muscles to contract. What that means is that a man can still experience orgasm, but has not, does not ejaculate. Hence the quote, all of the twitch, none of the spurt. Um, the doctor, doctors of Moby and Smith at King's College in London are the ones who are spearheading the current effort right now on the clean sheets pill. Uh, their current formulation reduces semen emission by 95%, and reversibility has been successfully demonstrated within 30 hours, which is really impressive. Um, unfortunately, as with multiple male contraceptive methods, they're stuck behind funding barriers. So they still are about three hundred dollars to $400,000 short of what they would need to start human trials. So, so far, the two methods that I've mentioned, ultrasound and the clean cheese pill, don't actually, don't have any significant side effects, which is fantastic. Check on the list. Um, but what about methods that might? So, a quick story. A few years ago, there was a trial looking at a hormonal birth control shot for men. So it was a combination of progestin and testosterone, uh, where men would come in and get this shot. It took a few weeks to kick in, as with a lot of hormonal methods, we've noticed that it, there is a delay in the suppression of fertility. Um, but after it kicked in, the, the trial ran for about three years, and in those three years, only four women became pregnant. So by all means, it looked like the, the, the method was working the way it should. Um, but then they cut the, the study short because the, the researchers saw the side effects, and the side effects were much more intense than they had anticipated. So what were these intense side effects? The side effects were acne, weight gain, mood changes including depression, and an increased libido. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like puberty. Um, so, but, so we're looking at this, and these anyone who's been on female hormonal birth control or who's maybe been with someone on hormonal birth control would think, well, yeah, that sounds kind of normal, right? That sounds like something that so many women go through all the time, right? But here's where things get a little odd, or this is where things start to differ in male contraceptive research, is that here we have a situation where male bodies are being subjected to treatments or interventions for the benefit of a different body. So, for, exa for example, or for clarification, men can't die of eclampsia. Men can't die in childbirth. So what we have suddenly here is a much higher standard for what could be an acceptable side effect, um, whereas, women working, uh, whereas women talking with their physician about which, which contraceptive methods to use, they might actually talk about the life-threatening um, potential of an ill-timed pregnancy. Women can weigh their lives in, in the balance sometimes against a high-risk pregnancy and s see that the side effects of a contraceptive are well worth it. Um, but in men, we have a very different situation. This is um, a kind of biological altruism. So it's definitely something to consider the, that the bar for side effects is different in male contraceptive research than it is in female re contraceptive research, for better or for worse. All right, back to the methods. Uh, method number three is heat-based methods. So this includes dry heat as well as wet heat. 
Um, and this is a phenomenon that's known uh, kind of in the, in the common or the, the popular minds. Hippocrates wrote about it in the fifth century, and um, we've had conversations about this, especially with uh, laptop use, right? So men putting laptops on their laps, and they're like, oh, what does that do to male fertility? So there's a general understanding of heat's effect on suppressing male fertility. Uh, we're still not quite sure how that happens. One theory is that it's heat shock factor. Um, heat shock factor is the, um, the threshold at which a cell will become disabled or start to die. So in the body proper, if I remember my numbers correctly, it's about 108 degrees Fahrenheit. But in the testicles, um, you need to raise and sustain the temperature above 98 degrees Fahrenheit in order for sperm cells to become disabled. Um, so one researcher who did a lot for this method was Dr. Marta Vogeli, who was a Swiss doctor who lived and worked in India in the 1930s to the 1950s. And uh, she developed the standardized protocol that she taught to um, presumably hundreds of men. And she was around in the community long enough to observe the normal offspring that, was, that um, were born after the return of the men's fertility. I'm not sure, I don't think it's on this checklist, but that's another very important criteria for contraception is that there's no deleterious effects on uh, offspring after uh, ceasing the, the method. So that was a really important observation from, from her work. So her protocol was to submerge the testes in water that was 116 degrees Fahrenheit for 45 minutes every day for three weeks, which would lead to about six months of sterility. If that sounds hot, um, take for example that residential water heaters are set between 120 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you've ever washed your dishes by hand, chances are you were probably around water that was about that hot. Never fear if you want to try this method for yourself though, um, you can, <laughs> You can try water that's about 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and she said that that would lead to about four months of sterility. So, something to consider. Um, and similar to ultrasound, though, we're still trying to figure out where the line is in terms of contraception versus sterilization. Um, so, anecdotal evidence suggests that using heat based methods for long term, so a decade or more, may lead to um, severely. Um, suppress fertility or potentially even sterilization. So this method, unfortunately, is um, starting to lose a little bit of favor in terms of being a, a true contraceptive. That, um, that didn't stop two researchers at Harvard, though, that created insulated under underwear uh, to keep the, uh, the testes close to the, or to the body, so next to the perineum. So kudos to their, uh, to their passion for that. Uh, but one thing that Vogeli was really along with wanting to promote this method. Um, she really talked a lot about how this essentially free contraception would greatly alleviate the effects of poverty. And so that's another thing to consider is that um, she was already in the 30s, 40s, and 50s thinking about population control and um, the ability for families to take care of themselves and to plan their size. And then, last but not least, the darling of male contraceptive research that's been making the news actually recently is called basal gel. Basal gel is based off of a method called RISUG, R-I-S-U-G, which stands for Reversible Inhibition of Sperm Under Guidance, was developed by a doctor in India. Um, and some men in India actually have been using this method for about 15 years now. Um, so what is basal gel? Basal gel is a non-toxic po polymer hydrogel that is um, essentially analogous to a no-scalpel vasectomy in the sense that it's injected into the vas deferens. It's a 15-minute outpatient procedure, and once the gel is set, um, it's presumed to last up to 10 years. Uh, it's, once it's in there, it's actually reversible, which is another huge win for us here. Um, and it can be reversed with a shot of either dimethyl sulfoxide or a sodium bicarbonate solution. Does anyone know what the common name is for sodium bicarbonate? Like baking soda? It's baking soda, which is just unbelievable to me for, from, a healthcare, uh, from a health system's perspective, how cheap is baking soda to have on hand, right? Uh, so it, to me, one of the, the best things about basal gel is that you can dissolve it with baking soda, which is just fantastic. Now, don't try it by yourself, please. Um, <laughs> go back to your healthcare provider. But the, the point is, is that um, a man could have basal gel and then three years, seven years, eight years later, decide that he wanted to restore his fertility and it could be flushed out. And uh, reversibility has been successfully demonstrated in rabbits as well as baboons now. Um, and as of 
last month, the researchers are putting together their paperwork to start human trials next year, I believe, with the aim of getting basal gel on the market here in the United States in 2018, which is very exciting. So those are our methods. Um, so tonight we just talked about four, but I really want you to get the impression that this is really, this is not it. There's so much that's going on right now. We've got botanicals like TW and Justicia gandarusa. Um, gandarusa being a, a plant in Indonesia that indigenous men have been using for I don't know how many generations, and we just caught on in the 80s, which is just incredible that they're looking at this. Next generation condoms, when you get the chance after the lecture, if you don't mind, um, Google origami condoms and galactic caps, which are just two of the um, next generation condoms that are being developed. We also have researchers looking at making condoms out of graphene, uh, which is an incredibly uh, resilient substance that also transfers body heat very well. Um, ZP glycoprotein mimic is a really incredible technology where the researchers are looking at binding with the enzymes in the head of the sperm cell, which means um, the man taking a pill to es essentially lock up the enzymes before the sperm are released into the female's body, which means that if the sperm can't use that enzyme package, they're not going to be able to fertilize an egg. Uh, there's hormone-based methods, so people are still looking at um, testosterone and progestin methods. Um, some really clever researchers have put together intravas devices, IVDs, which are analogous to an IUD, which is put in, which um, the IVD is then inserted into the vas deferens again. And then one that I recently came across was um, research into CATSPUR. So CATSPUR stands for uh, sperm-associated cation channels. Excuse me. These are four specific gene expressions in sperm cells that'll, that regulate their movement, their hyperactivity. What we have here is really incredible because in pharmaceutical research, there's um, a lot of discussion about targeting medication, right? So if you're giving someone um, a, a drug or if you're in, intervening in, in a system, you want to make sure that if you're giving someone medication for their liver, it's getting to their liver and <laughs> nowhere else, right? What we have here is essentially a target that's already built into sperm cells. Uh, so now what researchers are looking for is a drug that will help essentially um, disable cat spur expression. So really, there's a lot in there. Let me know if you're interested in starting research on any of these. I'd be happy to connect you with someone. So why, why though, if we have so many methods or potential methods, why aren't we doing anything about it? So I found this, this one author at Discover Magazine a couple years ago said about a, a birth control pill for men, said, will men remember to take it? Well, that's a good question. Will men want to take it? Another good question. Will it emasculate men too much to be worthwhile? Or men just too stupid and awful to ever be able to have that kind of responsibility? That's going a little too far, I think, but he has a really good point here. Um, what he's talking about are deeply gendered and social assumptions about men and women and whose responsibility it is for contraception. Um, a, f a few years, or a decade before that, actually, there was an international survey that, looked, that asked women in Scotland, China, and South Africa if they would trust their male partner to use a, a male birth control pill, and only 36 women, that's 2% out of almost 2,000, said they would not trust their partner with it. So why, why is there this, this disparity? Why do we have these, um, why is it that we have such a, such a big difference between our understanding of men at large and our intimate partners? So we have women who say that they're willing to trust um, their, their significant other, their personal man, as opposed to general men, right? So, this quote actually from the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development, which is a, a department of NIH, sums it up beautifully. The, the lack of progress in developing male contraceptives is due not to the biological complexity involving, or involved in suppressing the production of sperm, but rather to social and commercial constraints. Um, here they tell us straight out that it's social, that the reason why we're not developing male contraceptives is because no one's talking about it um, and no one's, no one's asking for it. 
or not enough people are asking for it. Another another thing that the report said, the, the report is called From Cells to Selves, if you want to find it. It's a, it's a fascinating read. Um, but they talk about commercial constraints. Um, so over the years, the, int the interest of big pharma or of pharmaceutical industry in developing contraceptives has uh, started to taper off really because, first of all, um, any research on reproduction is, is tough. <laughs> the stakes are incredibly high, and uh, lawsuits will definitely knock it out of even the most robust company. Um, but then also, mm -hmm. because there is this lack of um, social conversation about male contraception, about uh, men taking responsibility for contraception, uh, there is, there's very little um, reason for larger pharmaceutical companies to want to develop research in this. Um, there's a phenomenal paper called Astronauts in the Sperm World, which talks about the, uh, the social environment and that if we want male contraceptive research to be uh, successful, that we're really going to have to re-examine uh, what it means to be a man and what it means to be a responsible man, what it means to be a virile man. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot to consider in that. Um, but it's, it's worth considering because male contraception might be better than anything we can imagine. Human, uh, human research on contraceptives has gone through a lot of stumbling blocks, um, but because of that, we have ideal contraceptive uh, targets. We know what we're looking for now. Um, and the, as I mentioned before, the standard for um, side effects in male contraceptives is high. Uh, so what we could have is methods like vasal gel that have that are highly effective, right? So vasal gel works as a semi-porous plug in the vas deferens that allows spermatic fluid to pass through, but not sperm cells. Uh, we could have, vasal gel has no documented side effects, is comparatively cheap. So the researchers are looking at um, making it covered by insurance and about the same cost as a vasectomy. So if you're looking at LARCs, so long-acting reversible contraceptives, this fits right in. It's independent of intercourse, which is fantastic. Can't speak about non-contraceptive benefits, so we're, we might get a little in the weeds here. Um, and easily distributed and administrated by non-healthcare personnel. Again, if we can train people to give shots and vaccines, there's no reason why we can't train them to deliver basal gel or dissolve basal gel when the person doesn't want to have it anymore. So male contraception really might be so much better than we can imagine. So in 1974, Karan Singh, the then Minister of Population in, from India, led his country to the UN um, World Population Conference and famously declared, development is the best contraceptive. That's um, it's the most succinct summary of the, or the demographic economic paradox that says that when we see countries develop, we see their family size fall. Um, and largely, that is true. But there still persists some really um, frustrating trends in international family planning. We see that unintentional pregnancy rate does not, barely budges. Um, so currently in the world, it's about a little over 40%. In the United States, the unintended pregnancy rate is around 50%, which is just incredible. Um, we see that men across the world are... Um, younger men now are desiring smaller families than the older men. Um, and we see um, still total fertility rates are incredibly high in certain places in the world uh, where women don't have access to education, where we, where we really struggle to deliver contraceptives both as um, in a form of education and both in a form of technology. Um, so male contraception might be just what we need to break through these plateaus. Um, it might be a way to get to those men who don't want um, bigger families. In fact, uh, the man who was developing the ZP glycoprotein mimic is a father of six, and his wife challenged him to find a, a male contraceptive method, and that's how it got started, right? Uh, so, yes, development is a great contraceptive, and when we invest in families and we invest in, in education, we see a decrease in overall fertility, but what if it goes the other way as well? So thank you. I realize I totally whipped through that <laughs> that presentation. Um, but for more information, we have the, the Male Contraception Information Project 
is um, incredibly useful. Lots of information there. The Male Contraception Initiative also has a lot of really good information. And the, the Parsimus Foundation is actually the nonprofit organization here in the United States that bought the intellectual, res the intellectual rights to resug and brought it to the United States for development and getting it through the FDA uh, approval process. So all three of those sites are really good if you're interested in following up on this. The Parsmith Foundation also has really uh, has some good updates. So if you're interested, they, they're really good at quarterly updating. Um, also, since this is my master's lecture, I have a feedback survey that uh, Camila has agreed to email out to everyone. And um, so if you would please fill that out just to give me some feedback on what worked and what didn't work for you tonight, that would be fantastic. And you're also welcome to email me directly. Uh, this is my email address here. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Slendy for letting me speak here tonight. I really appreciate it, uh, her willingness to let me <laughs> address her class. Uh, Dr. Margolis and Dr. Burwandi are my two readers for my master's lecture. I'm grateful that for their patience and understanding as I put this together. Uh, Dr. Sokal and Erin Hamlin from the Male Contraception Information Project have been uh, very helpful and uh, inspiring. The Department of Maternal and Child Health, I'm also grateful to for allowing me to put together this project. Uh, my references as well, so all the people past and present who are doing work on this incredible topic. And then also my community, my family, friends, colleagues, and coworkers uh, for their, their patience, understanding, and incredible feedback. Uh, speaking of references, I have a lot. Um, you're welcome to look through them. They are organized by slide. And then since we still have a surprising amount of time, um, I have, excuse me, I wanted to ask everyone to pair up and start thinking about some of the, uh -oh. All right, we'll just put it there. What am I doing? <laughs> we can just go through the lecture again, that works. Um, if we could start brainstorming the application of male contraception to global um, health. So we talked about four methods here, ultrasounds the, with the portable ultrasound machine, um, heat-based methods, which really only require boil, boiling water, right? Uh, vasal gel, which is um, basically insert it and leave it method, a, a lark. And then also the clean sheets pill, which is a pill that you would take uh, before, um, a few hours before intercourse. So if we could pair up and just talk for a few minutes about um, how one or several of those methods might be, uh, what some of the, the barriers or the pros and cons of, um, what word am I looking for? of essentially distributing and administering these methods. So if we could take a few minutes to do that, that'd be great, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, let's come together again. Does any group have uh, anything they want to share with us? Do we have any? I also f- completely forgot to ask or to let you know that you can ask questions anytime. I realize that I talk incredibly quickly, uh, but I'd be delighted for, for any questions about any of the, anything that we talked about tonight. Um, but first, just the, the questions that I posed to you. So the, the pros and cons um, of one or more of these methods in a global health setting. Does, does anyone have any insights they want to share? Yes. So we were talking with Megan, one of the things that she refreshed our memory with. In our society, especially Western culture, if there's not money to be made, it's not going to happen. It doesn't matter how the goodness of your heart help your fellow man, not yet. Yeah, I know that's a, a good point, somewhat cynical, unfortunately, but it, it does seem to, <laughs> to operate. I, I um, disagree. Thank you. Um, ask UNC. Ask UNC? Oh, gosh. Um, maybe after I graduate, then I <laughs> turn around and ask. I mean, that's a really good point. So um, the Parsimus Foundation, the organization that bought the, the intellectual property rights to resug so that they could bring, bring that technology to the United States and market it and develop it as basal gel, um, are very clear on their website where they say that they are a social venture and they're developing this method, um, not because it's going to make them a lot of money, but because they believe that it's the right thing to do. Um, And it's amazing to see that um, they've relied so heavily on crowdfunding um, and just $5, $10 donations. So they have over 20,000 people on their mailing list right now um, who have just clawed their way through rabbit trials, baboon trials, um, and you know now they're gearing up to start human trials. I, th- I think they're actually based in California. So if anyone wants to go to San Diego and be eligible for those those trials, I'm sure they'd be thrilled. Um, but yeah, that's a that's an incredibly good point. Um, as a, a colleague of mine said, that um, a lot of a big reason why pharmaceutical companies wouldn't be into developing male contraceptives is because. Uh, they'd have too much skin in the game when they were first starting. The risks are way too high, especially if you don't have demonstrated uh, human trials and uh, safety results, efficacy results. The problem is, though, is how do you get those results in the first place, right? So that's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah, we can argue that money makes the world go around. Any other insights? Yeah. Well, Planned Parenthood says that these five methods are us, but this is from a, a, a gynecology textbook called uh, Gynecology by Ten Teachers. Okay. And, like, just that they had, like, what their impetus was for including those two, or, like, one of them seemed almost impossible to get, and the other one seemed like it would be a benefit that would be more substantial. Right. No, that's a really good point. Um, the, the acceptable to all cultures and religions is a whole other lecture in and of itself, I think. Um, so, for example, there was a, um, a study done in 2005 where 9,000 men internationally were surveyed. And um, incredibly, 57% of all respondents said that they would consider a hormonal method of male contraception. Um, the one holdout and the, the, one, the one country that stood out was Indonesia. And the, the number one reason that men cited as for, for their hesitation was um, if the method would be um, approved by the imam, or if the if the method would uh, be acceptable to Islam. Um, so absolutely, uh, religion is a is a huge thing, and so it is. It would be a really tall order that one method would hit every single one of these. Um, and it's it's worth saying that there is uh, there really is no such thing as an ideal contraceptive because ideal is going to be different for each person for each couple. Um, so no, that's a, a really good point. Thank you. And I'm not quite sure what the non-contraceptive benefits piece is, um, especially when, when you're looking at something like basal gel, which is really this inert polymer that's just you know, sitting in your vas deferens. I'm not sure if that's going to have any 
other biological benefit anywhere else, but that's not for me to say. Maybe our, our researchers in a couple of years will be able to tell us. <laughs> Thank you. Any other observations? Sure, and that's a, another really good point. Uh, part of the, the, social, the socialization of, of men or the socialization of, of women is that, especially for, for women, there's this understanding that you go in for your annual PAP exam, that you go in for your well-woman check. Um, but for, for men, there's not uh, often this, um, this same kind of pressure to go in and get checked. This, um, and so this kind of proactive um, health care, or this proactive taking your health into consideration would be part of um, what Nellie Udshorn said in her article, that the astronaut's article, um, shifting the idea of what it means to be a responsible man, uh, to be a sexy man. Uh, so, you know, saying that I went to the, I, I went to the doctor. I actually, this quote is a little racy, so it wasn't in the original presentation. So uh, you all, you all get to hear this one, but there was. Uh, and another author was talking about, you know, why wouldn't male birth control pills be sexy? She said, um, you know, having a, a condom in your in your wallet says I might get lucky tonight, but uh, taking a birth control pill every day says I get laid all the time, <laughs> which I thought was pretty impressive, right? You're like, so uh, why why isn't um, why isn't Vin Diesel any any sexier to me if you know every day at noon he's like, oh, hang on, baby. Like, right? Or does does is Rambo any less attractive because he has basal gel? I don't know. So, I think I saw it. Yes. I was wondering, you didn't really mention this, in terms of um, the uptake of some of these methods, if there's a difference between, um, I guess, men who are in monogamous relationships might be more inclined to do ultrasound. Um, but men who, um, and women, you know, who aren't monogamous, Right, hang on. I think I really like this picture here for that. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of the, the research um, that I've read on developing male contraceptive methods talk a lot about um, the male partner wanting to take res more responsibility uh, to alleviate some of the symptoms that his female partner might be having with um, the, the most, the classic example is um, the, the male partner wanting to alleviate hormonal, um, alleviate the female partner's um, side effect burden from taking hormonal contraceptives, and this is what we see. Um, and there's there's really not too much that I remember that's talking about uh, mm -hmm. single men and single men uptake, and the, I, I think the, the most reasonable and probably the, the shortest answer right now is that um, we don't have population level studies on this, so we can't actually say what method is attractive to which set of men, if that makes sense. Uh, so we are gonna have to wait to see you know, who self-selects to go get basal gel. Is it mostly single men? Is it mostly older men? Is it mostly uh, coupled men? Um, there was a, a really fascinating article from the Seattle Gay News, and the Seattle Gay News covered the clean sheets pill because of their interest in reducing HIV transmission. So in a population that has more or less no uh, you know, interest in contraception. Here they were actually, this, this writer was actually really excited about looking at a method that could reduce HIV transmission, right? Um, so the clean sheets pill, because it uh, prevents semen and other fluids from leaving the body, protects against fluid-borne um, STI transmission, which is incredible. That's HIV, chlamydia, gonorrhea, um, probably a couple others that I'm forgetting about. So the, the gay community then picked up and said, yeah, this sounds really, this sounds like a good thing. This sounds like something that we could benefit from. Um, so the, like I said, the short answer though is that since we haven't tried to market it yet, and that was actually something that I, I wanted to pitch to this class is help me market male contraceptives, right? So pick, pick a method and what's your bumper sticker for it. Um, but since we don't have these methods to offer yet, we don't know who's gonna take them, I guess. Thank you. It was a great question, though. Yeah. Um, yeah, I kind of tend to go along with that too. I think that some <clears throat> some of these these condoms that have been coming out are really interesting because I think a big you know barrier to using birth control is that it affects the pleasure of having sex. So you know, how can you how can you increase the, the uptake of, of certain contraceptive methods? And I think also. 
also because some of these controversial sort of health and pleasure issues are, you know, not so foreign to people. They might that might be like a good first step with trying to promote male male contraceptives. But who knows? Right. No, that's a that's a great point and something I think that that kind of goes unspoken with with sex is that sex is pleasurable and that a lot of people um, have sex for non procreative purposes. Um, and so um, I think that's a, a really great point in saying, you know, maybe baby steps, right? So where we, we start to um, including men in, in, the, in the family planning conversation by saying, look, we're making these methods more, um, maybe less disruptive to your pleasure. Uh, I found this great quote uh, where apparently Casanova, of, you know, famous Italian Casanova type called condoms the English frock coat because that's what it felt like when he was having sex is he was having sex with this huge overcoat on. Um, so that's I like that idea though. So how do we ease how do we ease the transition, right? Do we say like here this is a a, a product that's f familiar uh, enough or similar enough to a method that you you might be familiar with already? But the problem is is that condom use correct condom use correct consistent condom use is not nearly where public health people want it to be. And I think globally something like six percent of of couples rely on condoms as their as their primary method. It's just as much as public health officials love condoms because it's great, it's contraception and it's uh, STI prevention, it just does so many things. Um, when, it, when people get to the bedroom, if they thought to bring a condom, what are the chances that they're actually using it correctly? What are the chances that they're actually using it at all, right? Uh, but I like that. I, I think personally I might be intrigued to go buy an origami condom if I saw it at CVS. So, good point, <laughs> thank you. Any other, any other thoughts? All right, well, since I still have you for 15 minutes, I think I'm going to ask you to develop that bumper sticker. So please uh, feel free to pick any of these methods, and I'm happy to talk about any of them to you. And um, find a tagline for it. So um, there was a, a researcher, Dr. I think he's Dr. Wilson, who's done a lot of work with uh, men and masculine identity, and he uh, came up with something called the boy code. And the boy code is, uh, is surprisingly long and complex. Uh, but two things that, that really um, that stick out, especially for us here, is um, first of all, respect is incredibly important in the boy code. Um, and the other is um, the perception of strength. So knowing those two things about the boy code, how do you think we could market any of these methods to men? That's your uh, 007 mission, go.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, I just uh, had a, a really good question uh, for one of your classmates. She said, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm really happy with my method. It, it works really well. Um, it actually fits a, a lot of those criteria for me and my partner. I don't really see a need. It, it seems kind of uh, superfluous or redundant for him to get something like basal gel, right? She said, so why, where, where would we fit in? Where would, where would this couple fit in? Um, and so the, just the, the first thing, thing that came to mind was without knowing the official numbers, I can tell you that dual method contraceptive failure is so much more, um, are so much less likely than single method failure. Uh, whether we like it or not, every contraceptive has a, a perfect use and a typical use failure rate. Um, so even the, the most airtight uh, contraceptive methods, maybe abstinence withstanding, um, still fail or, or still um, result in a pregnancy sometimes. Uh, so just first of all, if you did want to be safe, doubling up on contraceptive methods, not condoms, <laughs> um, would be a, a good, would be a, a reasonable thing to do. But the other thing that, that came to mind and that um, I didn't include on my original slide for why we would have, let's go all the way back, you're gonna have these slides memorized by the time I leave. So another thing that could have made it to this list was um, if there was a change in reproductive health status of one or both partners, and the, the, one of the first things that came to mind for me was the postpartum period, or just pregnancy in general, right? So if a, a woman's uh, pregnant or immediately postpartum, that could potentially be anywhere from six to 12 months where the couple or the woman is looking for another um, contraceptive option, which would be a, a really nice thing. So if you had one partner who was steady, um, if you had a man who, had, who was using basal gel and his partner was recovering from a pregnancy, that'd be a whole year where she would have the time to find a contraceptive method that she liked or that would work for her or that would complement basal gel, right? So um, I thought that, was, uh, that would be a reasonable time when you're, uh, for a question just like that. So a couple that's already stable and happy in their contraceptive choice, um, but something that uh, we can when say is that reproductive health status changes throughout the lifetime um, and that's that includes pregnancy that includes um, abortion that includes illness and so there's there's any number of reasons why someone would discontinue or switch their methods and so having another partner using a, or having their male partner use a male contraceptive could help ease that transition um, so I thought that was a, a nice question so I, uh, I also heard some laughter out there and I'm curious to hear your taglines if you don't mind sharing I'd be Delighted to hear that. How are we going to market which method? Yes. Um, this one's actually more so for um, gay couples because it's like a pretty cheap pill, and I'm kind of using the play on words with a bumper, but I came up with bump my bumper with clean sheets. <laughs> <laughs> bump my bumper with clean sheets. I like that. Genius. Yeah. Yes. Ooh, nice. I like that. These are good. Anyone else? Take some carbon fiber for your wood tonight. Take some Ooh. Anyone else? Yes. Nice. I like that. Ooh, gelin, basil gelin. Oh, yes, I like this, basil gelin, this is fantastic. Uh, well, thank you so, so much. I'm glad that you all stayed. It's just about seven o'clock and I think um, I'm ready to leave you all. But um, again, if you, <laughs> if you have any, any questions, this is something that has been on my mind for months now and you're very welcome to email me. Um, please the, do fill, fill out the feedback survey. This is gonna be a part of my master's project reflection. Uh, so part of my grade rests on you, no pressure. Um, and yes, please email. I have all kinds of resources. I've got jokes, pictures, the likes. I'm amazed that I managed to get through this presentation without any graphic pictures, which I thought was also pretty impressive. Um, but thank you so much for your time. This has been an absolute pleasure.